It's to the best of our knowledge. I'm Anne Strandchamps. How do you get people to look, really look, at an old master painting? Well, in 2020, when art museums around the world were shuttered, L.A.'s Getty Museum issued a kind of playful challenge. Recreate a favorite work of art using just three objects you have lying around at home. I was, like everyone else, at home during lockdown with not a lot to do. Meet the celebrated British baritone Peter Brathwaite. As an opera singer, I was looking at my inbox, seeing the emails coming in saying that work was either being postponed or cancelled. So I sat at home scrolling through Twitter and saw this challenge and thought, well, maybe I should try this. Peter's used to playing roles on stage, so his idea was to reenact a historic portrait, make a costume, strike a pose, snap a selfie. There was just one problem. I wanted to to find an image that looked a little like me, but something that I noticed fairly early on was that I wasn't seeing very many faces of of colour. So I I searched for an image, and I had no idea that I'd set off on this huge voyage of discovery into rediscovering black portraiture. It went a lot further than he expected. And so I recreated an 18th century image of a young man. He's holding a lap dog. He has a silver tray and a glass of wine. And he's a servant in England, obviously in a stately home. I staged this in my front room. I was using my mother-in-law's cuddly toy dog thing (laughs) and um, (laughs) and I I had a glass of cranberry juice in my hand I posted it to social media and the response was fairly overwhelming people enjoyed the humour they were intrigued by the hashtag of rediscovering black portraiture and so I decided to continue and that carried on for 50 days solid (laughs) after that wow wow Fifty days was that like one one portrait a day? Yes, yeah. So it became hugely important. Peter Brathwaite has now researched and reimagined more than a hundred paintings of black subjects, from a 14th century image of Mansa Musa, the emperor of Mali, to the presidential portrait of Barack Obama, and he's still not done. What began as a game is a full-fledged questioning of art history. Also, a book and a museum exhibition called Rediscovering Black Portraiture. It was incredibly hard to find some of this work, and a lot of these portraits were created to illustrate the wealth of the patrons who commissioned them. Often a black subject was included to highlight the wealth of the individual. But that's not the full story. And we see individuals who are free, not necessarily enslaved, with names and navigating Western society in a very sophisticated way. It was difficult to encounter these works and see that there's so much that I haven't seen before. This is Mm really showing that what we see in galleries and museums is often the tip of the iceberg. And this is work that you had already been doing in some ways. You got interested in black portraiture quite a long time ago as an opera singer, right? Yes, yes. So I had a bit of a a tricky situation when I I was asked to lighten my my skin to to fit into a, a stage image in an 18th or 19th century opera that I was performing in. I mean, I'm sorry, can uh, I just interrupt seriously? Yes. Like, the director asked you to white up? Essentially, yes. Because it it was that tricky thing where we were 
staging an opera in a period where people would wear whiter makeup. Hmm. It was the fashion. And at that point, I wasn't knowledgeable enough to know that black people from that time wouldn't have whitened their faces in the same way that white people would have. And so I, I tried it. And then after the rehearsal, went home and did some research for myself. And I found Joseph Boulogne, the Chevalier Saint-Georges, who was a famed swordsman, composer, conductor, and he was mixed race. He was living in mm. France in the 18th century, a contemporary of Mozart. There's a film out about him at the moment. And so I turned up to rehearsals the day after with his image to show the director, and from then on was channeling him when I performed mm. on stage. And that was probably the first time that I tapped into a search engine, the words black portraiture. I was just thinking about the casual racism involved in, you know, just the assumption mm. that there weren't any high status black men and women in, say, 18th century aristocratic French circles. Yes. And at the same time, so many of the other portraits that you uncovered, there are black subjects in them, but they're nameless, anonymous. They're yeah. literally on the margins mm. of the portrait. Definitely. And the first thing I, I did with images like that was usually to crop them and center the, the black subject. So in the Paston Treasure, which was painted in 1665, which is a huge painting full of riches that the Paston family in Norfolk collected on their travels across the globe, the black figure is sat at the head of the table. He has a monkey on his shoulder, and no aspect of his actual self is in that original portrait. And he's way over on the side, right? So yes, the portrait yeah. is this portrait of this wealth practically spilling out of the frame towards you as the viewer. Yeah. And then way over on the side, you don't even notice him at first. No. It's this young black servant. And we don't know who he was, but we can infer from his presence there that he was trafficked, he was enslaved, and possibly knew a life of freedom before being enslaved. And so that's what I was focusing on when I was restaging it. I was meditating on what it means to take up space as a man of colour today, but also imagining what he would have known and the food he would have eaten. And mm. there's a dish from Barbados called cuckoo, which is the national dish. It's made of cornmeal and okra, and it's served with fish. And it's cooked using a wooden utensil called a cuckoo stick. And I gave it to him in my recreation. It's just finding these elements of joy that kind of dampen the, the trauma that's often found mm. in, in many of these images. Yeah. And then this history runs through your own family too, right? Yeah, and that's why the past and treasure is such a significant portrait in the project. It was painted in 1665, and we have the will of the first member of my family to move to Barbados. And his will was proved in 1665. He was called Miles Brathwaite. He traveled from Lancaster to Barbados, set up a plantation, has a lot of land, at the height of their wealth, the family owned around eight plantations. And this is a part of my history that is incredibly dark. One side of my family enslaved the other. My black side came from Ghana, we think, the, the earliest known black ancestor we have evidence of is a man called Addo. We think he was born in around 1742 and trafficked as a young man. He was owned by the Brathwaite family. They gave him their surname and he was freed after a slave uprising in Barbados in 1817, which was known as Busser's Rebellion. And he was freed for good conduct. And we're not sure what that good right. conduct involved. Right. Did that involve protecting the white family? or Possibly, yeah. yes. And the white side of the family had their portraits painted. They had monuments built when they died. And John Brathwaite is one of these ancestors whose monuments are in Bridgetown, Barbados, in London. There's 
a copy of one of them in University College London. And it's not something that I can very easily run away from. And, and my surname is Brathwaite. My middle name is John, like many of my enslaver ancestors. Lots of these names crop up again in the family history. And, and so it, it's really woven into my very being. And the best thing that I can think of to do with it is educate and respond to it artistically. Right. And so in some of your portrait recreations, you have your grandmother's quilt and mm. your grandfather's cuckoo stick and the manumission papers from yes. your four times great grandmother, but also some of those portraits of your enslaver ancestors. Could you pick one and tell me about it? Yes, there's the John Singleton Copley, the death of Major Pearson portrait that's from the Tate Britain Gallery. And it features a, a battle scene and there's a black servant protecting his master. And he's pointing a gun at the people he, he's attacking. And in my recreation, I've used printouts of the face of my five times great grandfather who was Miles Brathwaite the second we have his portrait he was known as the honorable Miles Brathwaite and I've used all of his images to represent the various faces in that portrait and instead of a gun I'm pointing the cuckoo stick at his face in my recreation <laughs> <laughs> um, so he, yeah, that there's something about the coming together of these cultures and me calling out to him, asking him to respond, and we'll never hear his voice, but I, I like to imagine what it would have been like to sit down at a table with him, and I doubt I'd ever be able to really truly understand what was going through their minds mm. when, uh, yeah, they they were obviously obsessed with wealth and this white gold that allowed them to create these empires. And the Brathwaite family motto is, not all of me will die. Oh. It, it really illustrates the, the deep rootedness of this history and, and how it, yeah, and it is everywhere know. around us. And, yeah. and including in your DNA. Yeah. One of the ones I keep coming back to is, and now, of course, I can't remember the title, but it's two young women in England. One is white and the other is black. Mm. They're cousins. And coming down through time, I guess the white girl was named, the portrait was named, the portrait of yes. her. And the black girl was not named and no. essentially erased. But they're both vivid personalities, Yes. The young black woman does not look like some subservient companion. Yeah, the image of Dido Bell. Yeah, she's with her cousin, Lady Elizabeth Murray. And Dido Bell is actually painted as if she's running out of the frame, off to do, I don't know, her, her next job on the estate or off to see someone. She's holding some fruit. But Dido Bell is someone who probably influenced the laws of the time regarding black people in Britain. Who was she? So she was the, uh, I should, I'm going to refer to the book to get this right. Because, yes, yeah, so she spent much of her life at Kenwood House in North London, living with her great uncle, William Murray, the Earl of Mansfield. And in the 1772 Somerset case, as Lord Chief Justice, the Earl famously ruled that slavery had no precedent in common law within Britain. And it's certainly possible that Bell influenced her uncle's views. Why do we not all know her name? Yes, yeah. Why do we not all know her history? Yeah. I love that she's pointing to her, her face. <laughs> she has her, her finger pressed against her cheek and she's looking out to us, smiling. And... Is her gesture in this portrait meant to challenge the racially based commodification underpinning the British aristocracy? 
there's definitely a reason why she's pointing to her own face in that image. Well, I, I just, I mean, paging through your book and looking at all of these, I just kept thinking, you've managed to make restorative justice that is beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, thank you for finding and restoring so many of these people. I mean, you've introduced us to people whose images we haven't seen and whose stories we haven't known. And in the process, you're really teaching all of us how to see differently. Yeah, that I'm really interested in looking and re-looking and, and then looking again once more. And, and that's my whole process, really. It's coming back to things. It's revisiting. And, and that's what I, I hope people are inspired to do. Peter Brathwaite is the author of Rediscovering Black Portraiture. Born in England and descended from relatives in Barbados, he's an acclaimed baritone opera singer and BBC Music Program presenter. Next, a mysterious portrait from 16th century Italy and the story behind it. I'm Anne Strainchamps. It's to the best of our knowledge. From Wisconsin Public Radio and PR. X. Imagine, it's the year 1560 in Ferrara, Italy. You're 16 years old, newly married to one of the richest, most powerful men in the country. And today, you're standing before him and the artist who is about to paint your portrait. Your name is Lucrezia de' Medici. Could I trouble Her Highness to please lift her chin a little? More? A touch more? Good. Beautiful. Now turn your face towards the window, slowly, please. Slowly. Yes, there. Hold that to your highness. Then, without turning his head, he addresses someone behind him. Do you see, your grace? I feel this may be better than the previous pose. We get the curve of her jaw, the elegance of her neck, Although how I will ever find a paint to reproduce that flush along her throat and that brow. Alfonso, clothed in dark colours today, moves about in the shadowy recesses of the room. He is examining sketches arranged on a low table. For several hours now, Lucrezia has been asked to pose in one way, seated, standing, Feet crossed, hands laced, hands apart, head forward, head aside, arm up, arm down, wrist turned, while the artist makes a sketch. He then repositions her and does another. Lucrezia finds the situation ludicrous. The idea that Alfonso is permitting another man to touch her dress or her hand or her jewels is so peculiar. If this man weren't painting her, It would not be out of the realm of possibility for Alfonso to unsheath the dagger he keeps in his belt and run him through. She has heard of men killed for less. Irish novelist Maggie O'Farrell is known for bringing lost historical figures to life. Her best-selling novel, Hamnet, recreated Shakespeare's family life. And in her latest, The Marriage Portrait, She tells us the story behind a real painting, a 16th century Renaissance portrait of a young noblewoman. O'Farrell told Shannon Henry Kleiber she came across a reference to it first in a poem, wondered what the painting looked like and who the young woman was. So I started looking it up, I started delving around, and it wasn't long before I had her name, Lucrezia de' Medici, and the really sad fact that she'd been 16 when she died. Mm-hmm. And then this portrait, which is attributed to Anilo Bronzino, was downloading on my very old phone screen. <laughs> and 
you know, I could see this kind of jeweled headdress and then I saw this very pale brow and then these very large, slightly startled looking brown eyes. She looks quite anxious. She's wearing this very dark dress against a black background with a white collar and she's she's adorned with jewellery, which I later found out is half from her father's dynasty and half from her husband to be's dynasty. But I, as soon as I saw her, it was a kind of lightning bolt. I mean, I knew as soon as I looked into her eyes that I was going to write a novel about her, that I was looking at the subject of my next book. Wow. What is it about portraits that's so revealing? I mean, you were so pulled in through her eyes and who would be the subject of a portrait in those times? Well, in those times, I mean, it varied. I think in order to have your portrait painted in 16th century in what we now call Italy, we're talking about Italy before Italy existed, in a sense. It was made up of a kind of jigsaw of city-states governed by men like Lucrezia's father, who was Cosimo de' Medici, Grand Duke of Tuscany, and her husband, who was Alfonso d'Este, Duke of Ferrara. But the kind of wealth that men like Cosimo and Alfonso had is absolutely jaw-dropping. I mean, Lucrezia's dowry was 200 gold scudi. I had no idea what that meant, so I asked a fiscal what does it historian. Mean? <laughs> yeah, well, apparently it's the equivalent of $50 million in today's money. I mean, Cosimo was unbelievably wealthy, so he was able to commission portraits of all his family, of himself, of his wife. He and his wife, Eleonora di Toledo, had pretty much an arranged marriage, as Lucrezia's was. But they, I think really unusually for their class and time, they really loved each other. They adored each other. Wow. <laughs> so, and he, the, the, one of my favourite portraits of her, because in the most expensive colour in those days was blue, because it was made from powdered lapis lazuli. But there's one portrait of Eleonora, <laughs> the background, which is normally landscapes, it's just blue. There's so much blue. And I just have this kind of vision of Cosmo saying, I want more lapis, more of it. I want <laughs> everyone to know how gorgeous my wife is and how lovely she looks and how rich we are. <laughs> so it's really to to tell people about your status. Yeah, it was also status, but I think it was about betrothal. Yes. You didn't necessarily see your future wife-to-be or your husband-to-be. So you would be sent an, literally an oil painting. It's like what a dating site would be now, but yeah, in those days. exactly. Yeah. A lot of marriages were arranged like that. Henry VIII apparently was very disappointed. He'd seen, I forget now which of his wives was it, he'd seen a painting of her and he'd approved and said, yes, okay, I'll marry her. And then when she actually arrived, he realised that the painter had been kind, shall we say. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> and he was yeah. apparently not very pleased with the in real life version. So I think it was problematic because I think yeah. as the artist, you'd want to be paid and you wouldn't want to do a warts and all portrait. But at the same time, <laughs> there's an awful lot riding on these portraits, you know, these kind of betrothal portraits in a sense. Mm-hmm. And I think it's so interesting about marriage itself too. If you're looking from the outside at someone's marriage, it's so complicated and depending on how you're viewing it and Do you think of that as part of how you were creating this story, that a marriage is a complicated thing? Absolutely. I felt very sorry for Lucrezia for a lot of reasons, actually, because she was married to Alfonso, who by many accounts was very cold and pretty heartless. I think really all he was looking for was basically just a womb that was going to produce lots of heirs for him and for his region. He was married to Lucrezia for a year before she died possibly murdered by him, possibly not. There was a rumour that he did murder her, but the autopsy, when she died, said that she died of natural causes. I should mention that the autopsy was performed by Alfonso's court doctor, so a man Mm -hmm. in his pay. When she died, Cosimo and Eleonora sent their court physician from Florence to attend the autopsy, but it was performed before they arrived. She was already buried. Mm -hmm. So make of that what you will. So the marriage portrait was created before she was married. Yeah, so the only portrait we have of Lucrezia is one that was commissioned by the Medicis just before she began her married life at the age of 15. One of the many questions that arose from me seeing that is that the other siblings, and as I mentioned, her parents, were painted numerous times in numerous iterations and positions. But Lucrezia was only painted once in this one portrait. Hmm. And even sadder than that, as I said, there is a room in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence dedicated to the branch of the Medicis that were Lucrezia's family. But she's not there. The rest Mm. of them are there. But I spent a long time, actually, when I went to Florence, trying to track down this portrait, the original of the portrait that I had seen. 
on the internet. And I know that it was in somewhere in the Uffizi Gallery. So I spent a long time trying to track it down in Florence because I couldn't work out where it was. And I had three art historians in Florence who were helping me and they couldn't find it either. We were really baffled. Mm. And eventually one of them said, I think it's in the Palazzo Pitti. So I went there and I had a printout of the portrait and I was showing all the guards. I said, can you, can you tell me where this portrait is? And they all said, no, I've never seen it before. It's not here. You've made a mistake. I don't know where it is. So I spent ages, about hours walking around and eventually I found it. And it's in this very, very small, quite distant, very crowded room. I mean, crowded with portraits. And it's low down on the wall next to a fire extinguisher. And there she is. Oh. And it's about the size of a hardback book. And that really broke my heart. I thought, why Why is she over here on her own? Why isn't she with the rest of her family? Mm-hmm. And why is she in such an ignominious position? She ought to be in in the main Uffizi. She ought to be in that room with her family. She deserved her story to be told by you. Yes, exactly. It just maybe well, I just from all kind of sources or all accounts, I just always got the impression it was impossible not to get the impression that Lucrezia was overlooked and underloved. You know, I often think a lot of portraits of the type young girls in the Renaissance, you know, a lot of them look very kind of meek and expressionless, almost blank. It was the style, I think. But Lucrezia looks really troubled. She looks worried. She looks anxious. And thank crucially for me, she looks as if she has something she wants to say. Mm-hmm. And you are painting a portrait in The Marriage Portrait. Mm-hmm. I mean, you are doing that. Yes. And there's a kind of motif that runs through the novel, a symbol, I suppose you'd call it, where as I was researching it, I read about you know the sort of techniques that Renaissance artists used. A lot of these artists were actually very poor. They lived from hand to mouth. So a lot of them actually painted over old canvases or old mm-hmm. work or old tableau. So, and that really thrilled me, that idea, the idea that you might go to a gallery and there are these incredibly famous paintings, but there might be another painting behind them. But we don't know that because... Who would take a <laughs> who would take turpentine to birth of Venus, you know? But the idea that it's possible, you know, it's people have x-rayed the Mona Lisa and have seen that Da Vinci tried out different iterations of her smile before settling on the last one. And to me, that feeds a lot into the knot. You know, I wanted the idea of the underpainting, other narratives hiding in the shadows behind the one that we think we know. Hmm. I love the idea of the underpainting that's through your book. And you did that, delving deeper into these layers. What was going on in your life when you were working on this book? Probably suffice to say that I had the idea first in February 2020. Um, (laughs) So I probably don't even need to say what what ensued. So I wrote this book pretty much. It was bookended by the pandemic and by lockdown. And essentially, actually, Lucrezia and her brothers and sisters lived in lockdown their whole lives, Mm. you know, to be the daughter of an incredibly powerful ruler like Cosimo to be born into that dynasty. Obviously, she was born into a life of enormous, enormous privilege. But at the same time, it was too dangerous for Lucrezia and her brothers and sisters because they were the very, very precious heirs to the Medici throne. They could be kidnapped, they could be assassinated. So they were kept indoors pretty much all their life. As children, they lived in two rooms up on the fourth floor of the palazzo. And if they wanted exercise, they would walk around the battlements. And that was it. <laughs> and so you related as you were during the pandemic. Well, I, realized, I mean, yeah. I suppose I only thought about it really afterwards. But yeah, I don't think it's a coincidence that, <laughs> that I was writing about a life of confinement. How do you think modern day portraiture, photography, Instagram can show things in a different way from that portraiture? Or... How is it the same? I mean, I look back at these gorgeous layers of paint and think that stands forever. And then these kind of fleeting Instagram things that can be deleted, but maybe they are forever too. I mean, our online persona can be forever. Hmm, That's true. Yeah. I will say that to my kids as a warning. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I think in a lot of ways, it's pretty much the same. You know, obviously the world changes all the time. The world of Lucrezia living in the Palazzo Vecchio is completely gone. Our world would be utterly alien to her. But I think at the same time, 
human hearts and minds and brains haven't really changed that much at all. And when people are posting pictures on Instagram, they want to wear the nicest clothes and their best jewellery and their makeup and they want their hair to look good, just as the Renaissance people did when they were getting ready for their portrait. They were thinking about what cloth flattered them the most. They were thinking what jewellery, how to wear their hair, you know, how to stand. Did they want to lean on books to look clever? Did they want to have their region behind them to say, check out how powerful I am? You know, it's it's actually just the same, isn't it? <laughs> so interesting. <laughs> Maggie, this is great. I just so enjoy reading your books. Beautiful. Oh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. That was novelist Maggie O'Farrell, author of The Marriage Portrait. She talked with Shannon Henry Clyber from her home in Edinburgh. Why does the portrait figure so prominently in the history of art? Most of the paintings he made, like the big ones, yeah. they hung them on the walls and they kind of looked like wall paintings. Very big uh, where, civic where guards. Where go for those tall rooms? Yes, so you take his door and then all the way follow just the rooms. Coming up, we travel to the Franz Halls Museum in the Netherlands, looking to uncover the secrets of one of Europe's greatest portrait painters. I'm Anne Strainchamps. It's to the best of our knowledge from Wisconsin Public Radio and PRX. If you want to get a sense of why portrait painting looms so large in the history of art, there's no better place to go than the old city of Harlem, just outside Amsterdam. Steve Paulson takes us there. Just a few blocks from the huge cathedral that towers over Harlem's main square, the Franz Hals Museum holds an exquisite collection of 16th and 17th century Dutch art and the largest collection of paintings by Hals himself. Frans Hals was one of the great painters of the Dutch Golden Age. Unlike his contemporary Rembrandt, he only ever painted portraits, and today he's regarded as one of the greatest portrait painters who ever lived. So my name is Thijs Gerbrandi, which is a very difficult Dutch name, <laughs> uh, but I'm an uh, educator at the Frans Hals Museum. The thing to know about Harlem in the 17th century is that it was a city of migrants. Once the Catholic Kingdom of Spain conquered Flanders, there was a massive exodus of Protestants moving north to Amsterdam and other Dutch cities. They brought new skills and trades and created a new merchant class. And Harlem facilitated a lot of those people, including the family of Franz Haus, because they mostly were in busy making draperies, linen, or beer. And Harlem was very famous for its beer. Why? Because we're next to the sea and there's the dunes and there's lots of fresh water coming from. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people from Harlem made beer and those people (laughs) became incredibly rich Hmm. and those people shaped the history of the city. So what did that mean for the artists who were here? The Netherlands are famous for the amount of paintings that were produced. Millions were produced. That's much more than in any other country in Europe at that time. So we see lots of people, ordinary citizens, of course, with a little money, but also you could see, for example, a baker who owns a painting. And that would, of course, not be a Rembrandt or a Franz Hals at that time, but that would be a drawing, that would be an etching, that would be a smaller painting. But everyone had paintings. Hmm. Apparently, the market was so big that you could live of painting church interiors alone. That's it. And that shows uh, how much demand there was for these kind of paintings. People build new houses, you need to fill those houses. You need a cabinet, you need a clock, you need a painting, you need a vase, and you combine those things. (laughs) And all these Dutch painters, not just the famous ones like Rembrandt and Halls, but they could make a living just painting? Yes, not all of them, of course. And I mean, the fact that Franz Hals, in the end of his life, needed funding from the state to sustain his living with all his children. But most could. If you were a painter, you became a master, so to speak, and you had to join a guild. Only if you were in a guild, you could have your own workshop. Why did you have to join a guild if you were a painter? For economic reasons. They wanted to control, in a certain way, the quality of the product. Hmm. And if you were 
joining a guild, it meant you had proven yourself to be a master. So Franz Hals obviously had a lot of students, like Rembrandt had a lot of students, like Rubens had a lot of students. All those master painters had students. Why? Because also those students paid money to become a student. And after year six, you would become a master. Of course, you first painted in the tradition of your master and then gradually you developed your own style. The style that Franz Hals developed was distinctive, and today it's considered a transformative turn in the history of art. He seemed to capture the ordinary moments of daily life, and he painted with broad brush strokes. It's no accident that centuries later, the French Impressionists would come to revere Hals. To the modern eye, we like this Impressionist idea of seeing the brush stroke instead of concealing the brush stroke. Mm. Norbert Middlecope is the curator of old masters at the Franz Halls Museum. It is sometimes as if the people hardly posed for him, as if they are still moving around with their eyes, with their heads, as if we just came on the moment that Franz Halls captured in paint. So it always makes an impression that he hardly needed any time to paint a full portrait. He's published widely on the Dutch masters, and he has a very personal connection to Halls himself. I grew up in Haarlem, and uh, as a young child, I, uh, I used to come here after school. So it's, uh, the Franz Hals Museum is, is really the museum of my childhood. But, um, yeah, he's so much part of the city's consciousness. Every Haarlem school child will visit Franz Hals Museum at least once. That's how it started with me. Uh, I went, came here with school when I was even... Well, maybe nine or ten, and that's how it started. Today, Franz Halls is considered Harlem's greatest painter. And the Halls Museum has many of his masterpieces, including one entire room of group portraits of Harlem's old civic guard. These are massive paintings. Some stretch more than a dozen feet across, each officer's wearing a sash in the color of his brigade. Some men are feasting and laughing at a banquet. And others look serious, even haughty. And what's so striking about a Hall's portrait is how the personality of the sitter almost seems to leap out from the canvas. After I left Harlem, I kept thinking about Franz Hall's and how an artist who lived 400 years ago can still feel so fresh today, and what it meant to be a portrait painter in the 17th century. I wanted to know more, so I sat down with the newest biographer of Franz Halls. I think he's an undersung hero of what has often been called the Dutch Golden Age, but Franz Halls, I think, is certainly one of the great triumvirate of 17th century Dutch painters, along with Rembrandt and Vermeer. But I think he really recreated or renewed what it is to paint a portrait of somebody. This is Steve Nadler, a philosopher who has written widely on Dutch history and culture, and he happens to live just a few blocks from where I do in Madison, Wisconsin. His biography of Franz Halls is called The Portraitist. We know that by the 16-teens and the 1620s, Halls has established himself as an important portraitist. All he painted were portraits. Um, Which is sort of an astonishing thing in itself. For instance, Rembrandt, of course, did paint portraits, but he painted a lot of other stuff as well. He did. And if you're a portrait painter, you better have a lot of good commissions. And we know that Hals suffered from financial difficulties throughout his life. And even in the 1620s, he turned to what we now call genre painting. But even these are portrait-like. They are pictures of anonymous individuals drinking, blowing bubbles, laughing, fooling around in various ways. And that's how he made his living. So you're, you're absolutely right. It was unique for somebody to develop themselves so singularly to just one genre of painting. Now, Franz Hals has a very distinctive style of painting, very different than Rembrandt, for instance. Noteworthy because it's sort of broad brush strokes, right? Yeah. Although even Rembrandt, as his career progressed, adapted that technique. It's possible that Rembrandt himself started using that rougher brushwork after having seen Hals do it in Arlenberg's studio. And Hals was a little bit older than Rembrandt. Yes, he was. So it's more likely the influence went from Hals to Rembrandt. But you're absolutely right. As we see Hals's 
um, work develop over the decades, the brushwork becomes rougher. Now we call it rough, and contemporary art theorists in the 17th century distinguished the rough from the smooth, but we shouldn't think that this is something that he just tossed off very quickly. We know that he went through a very careful process of priming the canvas, doing preliminary brushwork on the canvas, what's called dead coloring, and then finishing it off. But it's not as if he sat in front of a canvas and just went whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Right. And when you go and see a house painting in person, if you go to the Franz Haus Museum in Harlem or the Rijksmuseum or the Frick in New York or anywhere, it's simply amazing how the effect that you took for fine detail from a distance is up close, really just a series of abstract dabs and slashes of paint. The other thing that's so striking about a lot of the Hall's portraits is it seems like they capture this moment in time. There's an odd gesture. There's a smile or a laugh. or it's, It reminds me of a photograph today, sort of like this, this instant moment that he's often getting. I mean, there's some that are sort of more studied portraits with people sitting, but was that unusual at the time? I think it was innovative. There are a lot of lifeless portraits coming out of the 17th century. <laughs> so I think, no, I think you're absolutely right to pick up on that, that there's something lively about a house portrait. Everyone seems to be in motion and he seems to have captured them at a moment. Many of the militia guild portraits where they're shown celebrating the end of their service, there's a banquet, there's laughing, there's drinking, there's food being passed along. You can almost hear the noise. And then later on, centuries later, the Impressionists, the French Impressionists rediscovered Franz Halls, right? Yes. Van Gogh was a huge fan. Sometimes we're told that he was rediscovered in the 19th century. I don't think he was ever lost. It's likewise Vermeer. But he really didn't come back onto the main stage until French critics in the 19th century really paid more attention to him. Van Gogh believed Hals was probably the greatest colorist he'd ever seen, the way he was able to blend colors and make everything come alive chromatically. Now, the other thing about portraits, and I, I'm really curious about why the portrait seems to fascinate us, it has always fascinated us to this day, and the self-portrait in particular. If you think about Rembrandt, for instance, and right. those self-portraits when he was old, it's almost like he was contemplating his own mortality. Do you see that in a Hall's painting? I mean, some, I mean there, there's the sense that, oh, maybe you're kind of getting a glimpse of someone's soul. It's tempting to say that and to think that. <laughs> um, it's possibly true. The temptation that I try to resist is looking at a portrait and thinking, ah, oh, I know what this person is thinking, or I know this person's character, personality. Let's go back to philosopher, for example, uh, Descartes who was a notoriously arrogant person. And Hals did a portrait of Descartes in 1649. And the man in this portrait seems to be a touch arrogant. <laughs> but would I think that if I didn't know that Descartes was already arrogant? So seeing the soul of a portrait sitter, how much of it is really something that the painter themselves have captured or what we bring to what we know? But that's the fascinating question, yes. is just seeing a painting of someone. It's never going to reveal exactly who that person is, although we might guess who that is. But then also it's like, what do we bring to that? Yeah. And I think that's the difference between a great portrait painter and a mediocre one. Let's put the poor portrait painters aside. <laughs> I think part of what's fascinating for us lay people in portrait painting is how incredibly accurate a person's face is captured this creative individual can take emulsified pigment, put it on a flat surface, and somehow create a three-dimensional picture that tells us exactly a good portrait painter, tells us what this person looked like. I think that's part of our fascination with portraits. Perhaps the other fascination is that we do think we're being given more than just an image of what they look like, but some feeling for who they were. Well, I'm also thinking that humans are a very visual animal. And the thing that we look at more than anything is someone else's face. And right. we're trying to get some sense of the emotion of the other person. And that's what comes through in a good portrait. So what do you look at first in a portrait, the eyes or the mouth? That's a very good question. I don't know. I'm fascinated. By, well, I actually look at hands. <laughs> um, only because hands are really difficult to get right. Right. And a lot of painters hide the hands. Mm-hmm. There's been a great deal of debate lately about whether a girl with a flute, Vermeer's painting this in the 
National Gallery in Washington is a Vermeer, is how poorly the hands are done. Would really, mm. Vermeer really have done hands like that? Mm -hmm. But once they get past the hands, <laughs> I think it's the eyes to me. Yeah, the highlights, the gleams, the shape, the look—you can tell a lot of a person's eyes. If you think about probably the most famous portrait in the history of art, the Mona Lisa, what is it that draws us to that? I mean, I think it's something about we're trying to figure out what she's thinking. I mean, it seems like a smile, but right. is it really a smile? So there we go for the mouth first, right? We go for the mouth, but the smile is in the eyes too, I yeah. think. Or is it a real smile? So we're sort of trying to guess at what that is, or you know, some of the other famous portraits in the history of art. Van Gogh's self-portrait, Vermeer's girl with a pearl earring. It seems like in all those cases, there's something, it's hard to read. Yeah. Maybe that's the sign of the greatness in a portrait is it can be interpreted in different ways. The other thing about eyes and mouths, and ears, and maybe hands. <laughs> there was an art writer, his name was Morelli, and he came up with what he thought was a scientific technique for connoisseurship, for determining who painted what. And he said, painters have their characteristic ways of doing certain body parts, and so he focused sometimes on ears. There's a, a Hals way of doing an ear, there's a Rembrandt way of doing an ear, there's a Van Gogh way of doing a missing ear, I suppose. Um, <laughs> I think of the Van Gogh ear, not just the missing ear, but I don't think of other people's ears. That's interesting, I mean, other portrait painters. Well, he thought maybe because the ear is not front and center, that that's where you're gonna see their characteristic, the painter's characteristic mark. But why not think the same is true of eyes? There's a way of doing an eye or a way of doing a mouth. Some painters like to outline things. Hals never did. And I think Vermeer and Rembrandt as well, they built their facial features up with layers of color. If you think about the history of art and the fact that there are entire museums that are just portraits, the National Portrait Gallery in DC, there's the comparable version in London, I believe. I'm sure there are other, it's not at all obvious why we would have this fascination with portraits, just like one portrait after another in an entire museum. How do you explain that? I think it takes you back. If you're fascinated by 18th century America, you want to situate yourself among the people who were there. See, how did they look? What did they wear? How did they carry themselves? I think this is true both of painted portraits and especially photographic portraits. I love photographs of Lincoln. There's just mm -hmm. something that grabs me about those. I mean, the other thing that's so striking about so many of those older portraits is they're very rarely smiling. Right. Because if you smile, but you're not serious or something, I don't know, why would that be? It might have been something to do with 17th century teeth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, so that's, I think that's the other striking thing about Haas's portraits. I think there, there's a lot of teeth. There's a, more smiles and laughs in Haas's paintings than any other painting of early modernity. Have you thought much about portraits in photos? You mentioned you really like Lincoln photos. Yeah. What attracts you? photographic portraits? Partly it's who the photograph is of, being fascinated with Lincoln to begin with, or just generally, I love seeing photographs of US presidents from that period. The technology fascinates me, seeing the changes in the ability to focus, but also cultural items, what they're wearing. Lincoln's hair is always a mess, why is that? <laughs> and was there not a handler next to him with a comb? <laughs> Um, so maybe that was the point, that he wanted to convey a certain image. Perhaps, I yeah, yeah, I don't care about my hair. I've got a war, to, I've got a country to hold together. <laughs> right. yeah. So I wanna come back to this whole question of how much a portrait, whether a photograph or a painting, can reveal the person. And I mean, coming back to your example of Lincoln, I mean, I too am fascinated by photos of Lincoln because I have a sense of, oh, that's who he was. Yeah. I mean, I can read lots of books about Lincoln, I can get some sense of him, but it's seeing that, takes me there, isn't that ultimately the attraction of think, a portrait? Yeah, it puts you there. And especially when it's more than just a portrait of a person, but if there's a pendant and you see them interacting with their spouse, the photographs of Lincoln standing in the field with his generals towering over them. And then especially the series of photographs as a younger man and seeing him age as a war. I mean, there's the parallel with Rembrandt's mm -hmm. self-portraits, that final photograph of Lincoln he looked a very old man by the end of the war. Or even think of Obama. Yes. From when he started his presidency to when he ended, he's aged quite a lot. He has. But we're fascinated by Pete Souza's photographs of the whole Obama administration, seeing Obama 
interacting with others, playing on the carpet with a young African-American boy and sitting at the desk eating his almonds. We want to see these people engaged in the activities that made life meaningful for them. That's Steve Nadler, a philosopher at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and author of The Portraitist, Franz Halls and His World. He was talking with Steve Paulson. So we took you all over the world today, but to the best of our knowledge is produced in Madison, Wisconsin, at Wisconsin Public Radio, by Shannon Henry Kleiber, Charles Monroe Kane, Angelo Bautista, and Mark Rickers. Our technical director and sound designer is Joe Hartke, with help from Sarah Hopeful. Additional music this week by Gregor Quendel, Junya Nichimura, Nick Kupfer, and Happiness in Airplanes. Special thanks to Jeremy Crosmer for his quartet arrangement of the 18th century black English composer George Bridgetower. Steve Paulson is our executive producer, and I'm Anne Strangehamps. Thanks for listening. <laughs>